This is one of the most advanced robot actuators, the internal cycloidal drive. By placing a cycloidal reducer inside an outer rotor BLDC motor, you can achieve a compact yet high torque power source. Today, I'm going to take you through every step of developing this internal cycloidal drive, from the motivation behind it to the structure, assembly process, and basic functionality tests. I've also made the CAD files publicly available. So by the end of this video, you'll have everything you need to build one yourself. I decided to develop this internal cycloidal drive because I wanted to build a quadruped robot. Over the next six months, I plan to create a quadruped robot to sharpen my technical skills, and I'll be sharing the process on this channel. This video focuses on the hardware side of the actuator specifically for such a robot. Let's jump right in. When it comes to a robot's hardware, the three core components are the motor, the reducer, and the driver. The internal cycloidal drive combines these three elements in a highly integrated way. The motor used in this setup is an Outrunner type BLDC. BLDC motors are considered longer lasting, quieter, more efficient, and more precise compared to brush motors. That's because brush motors use mechanical contacts to switch the polarity of the electromagnets, causing friction, wear, energy loss, noise, and mechanical constraints on control. In contrast, BLDC motors use electronic control to switch polarity, resulting in minimal friction and no mechanical limitations. A BLDC motor has a rotor with permanent magnets, and you can place that rotor on the inside in runner or the outside outrunner. An in runner rotor has less inertia, making it ideal for ultra fast response. An outrunner rotor, on the other hand, generates higher torque because the force acts over a larger radius. For a quadruped robot joint that needs moderate speed and high torque, an outrunner design is more suitable. Another advantage of an outrunner design is the large space in the center of the stator. By placing a reducer in that space, you can create a compact actuator that also delivers high torque. So, which reducer should you choose? There are typically three well-known mechanisms. Planetary gears, their biggest advantage is that they don't require highly specialized parts, making them inexpensive to manufacture. As a result, planetary gears see widespread use in many fields. Cycloidal gears, their standout feature is their robustness. The load is distributed across multiple rolling contact points, allowing for extremely high torque, strong impact resistance, and long service life. They also have high rigidity, making them more resistant to deformation, perfect for harsh environments. Harmonic gears, their most prominent characteristic is incredible precision. They have nearly zero backlash and are therefore often used in robotic arms. For this project, I chose to go with cycloidal gears. Quadruped robots experience significant shock loads on their joints, especially upon landing. The durability of cycloidal gears is highly appealing in that context. Moreover, they deliver high torque while maintaining good precision, efficiency, and quiet operation, an all-around balanced option. So, as you can see, Using an Outrunner BLDC motor with a cycloidal reducer in the center is a very logical solution for a quadruped robot actuator. However, cycloidal gears do have two main drawbacks, reduced efficiency at high speeds and manufacturing difficulty. First, efficiency drops at high speeds because the cycloidal mechanism relies on an eccentrically rotating disc. When an off-center mass spins at high speed, it generates vibration. To solve this, cycloidal reducers typically use a second disc running in the opposite phase to cancel out the eccentric motion and reduce vibration. Next, manufacturing these gears can be difficult because they require precise machining of special shapes, such as the cycloidal discs and the eccentric mechanism. This is where the sponsor of this video, JLC3DP, comes in. JLC3DP, the future of manufacturing with advanced 3D printing services. Their streamlined online platform allows for easy upload of 3D models, instant quotes, and real-time order tracking. From material selection to the speedy delivery of final products, they meticulously manage every step with production times as fast as 24 hours and delivery within just two days. By watching this video and becoming a new JLC 3DP user, you can receive coupons worth up to 60 US dollars. 
Check out what JLC3DP can do for you at the link below. It took about six days to receive my parts after ordering. So let's check them out. There are many critical components here that require tight tolerances, yet they arrived with no warping at all. Here's a part one printed myself using resin 3D printing at home. You can see some distortion on the side where the support material was attached. But on the same shape printed by JLC 3DP, there's no warping whatsoever. If your project requires high precision 3D printed parts, definitely check out JLC 3DP. You'll be amazed by their quality. Now, let's assemble the actuator. First, I'll attach the magnets onto the rotor using an adhesive. I'll make sure each magnet is placed so that the polarity alternates one after the other. With that, my 42 pole rotor is complete. Next, I'll wind a 20 AWG coil onto a stator that has 36 slots. There's a specific pairing between the number of permanent magnets on the rotor and the slots on the stator, and having more poles and slots generally makes rotation smoother. I'm using a star winding for this setup. Next, we'll assemble these components together. I'll embed some nuts into the output part so other components can be attached later. I'll do the same for this piece as well. Next, I'll attach the stator to the housing. Next, I'll install the screws to secure the bearings and other components. After fastening the screw, I'll slide the bearings onto it. I need to be careful not to lift the partially assembled actuator at this point. Otherwise, the screw and bearings might all come loose. Once I've placed the first set of bearings, I insert a spacer, then add the second set of bearings. I apply some grease to reduce friction. Now I'll insert the cycloidal disc. By the way, the reduction ratio is 10. When a 10 to 1 ratio is used, the number of outer pins is 11, which is one more than the ratio itself. If you turn the output screw, you'll notice it rotates smoothly with an eccentric motion. This part here is the eccentric shaft. Because of this shaft, the second cycloidal disc is mounted in the opposite phase. As before, I'll install bearings, then a spacer, then bearings again on the screw. I'll also add grease. Here's the second cycloidal disc. And this is my input shaft, which will be turned by the rotor. You can see how the two cycloidal discs rotate in opposite phases. I secure these parts so the screws don't come loose. It seems to be running smoothly. Then I secure the output screw with this piece. Back drive also appears to be working just fine. Next, I'll attach the rotor. I have to be extremely careful. These magnets are very strong. At this point, I've run into a problem. The permanent magnets are sticking to the stator, so there's no rotation at all. I designed it so there would be about a one millimeter gap between the magnets and the stator, but I allowed too much clearance between the shaft and the bearings. As a result, the shaft and rotor ended up tilting. In addition, the rotor and shaft are made up of five separate parts and it seems each connection point might be causing some distortion. It's generally better to reduce the total number of components wherever possible. For now, I'll rework the dimensions so that the shaft can be press fit into the bearings, and then I'll put everything back together. Because the rotor was tilted, the winding got scraped, so I'm going to rewind it. Since 20 AWG wire was too thick and hard to handle, I'll switch to a slightly thinner 22 AWG. I also took the opportunity to polish the rotor, 
so it's nice and smooth. I've finished making the adjustments. There's still a bit of a tilt in the rotor, and it does make slight contact with the stator, but it's spinning much more freely compared to before. It might just be good enough to run now. Let's give it a try. I'll test it using a low-cost ESC and a regulated power supply. Because there's still a bit of contact, it can't quite start spinning on its own. But once I give it a little push by hand, it does begin to rotate. Because of the contact, it's pretty noisy at the moment, but with a bit more refinement to the design, I think it could run much more smoothly. It seems the output shaft is functioning properly as well. The speed should be about one-tenth of the input, and the torque roughly ten times greater. That's all for this video. We went from the hardware design of the internal cycloidal drive to testing its operation and managed to get it running. Along the way, I found plenty of ways to improve the design. In the next video, I'll implement those improvements in a newly designed actuator and then drive it using my own FOC-capable ESC. I also plan to test the actuator's performance. With field-oriented control, I'll be able to get the most out of the internal cycloidal drive, allowing for high-precision control of position, speed, and torque. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. Also, if you're interested in supporting my work, I'd really appreciate it. Whether by joining my YouTube membership or supporting me on Patreon, your help will speed up development. Plus, all my projects are released as open source, so they might benefit others as well. Lastly, if you want to explore the CAD data for this internal cycloidal drive, you can download it from the GitHub link in the description. Feel free to check it out. I'll see you in the next video.